we have to speak to the frustration of black men and feeling neglected in the outreach, feeling neglected and being heard, feeling neglected and being a part of the actual democratic process when it comes to, you know, the things that are important to us. Because a lot of times you, I feel like my personal opinion, the way the Democrats reach out to us is through things that don't like um, it affects us, but not in the way that they think it does. Like criminal reform isn't the only thing that we care about because we are not all criminals. The microscope that has been put on black men, it shows me that we tend to have a lot more sway and a lot more power as a voting bloc. And we should recognize that and do a better job of utilizing that and, you know, utilizing that leverage to get the things that we need for our communities. Um, I think this speaks to the fact that maybe our vote does matter because, you know, for a while they tried to make it seem like black men's vote specifically didn't matter if they had the black women's vote. But now looking at this race, you like, no, the black men's vote, especially for a black candidate, because we have to add that context as well. Right. Especially for a black candidate, you need every black vote you can get. Let's embark on the ARC Republic to hear current news that's published. More than gossip and chatter, covering current affairs that matter. We talk issues with professional views, all keeping you in queue. We wanted a higher vibe for these days and times. The free the voices and minds, reporting the sign of the times. So all can build, let's shine, yeah. Greetings, greetings, greetings. What up, what up, what up? Wherever you are situated in this universe, my name is Dr. Kaia Niambi Shivers, and we are again talking on Art Republic News podcast. It has been a minute. It definitely has, but uh, life be life in. But we are three weeks away from the election, and this election has taken a lot of twists and turns. So I want to talk to Dame Crawford, our regular contributor uh, on the West Coast, uh, the left coast, which is the best coast. I'm saying, <laughs> so what's up, Dame? How you doing? What's going on? How you feeling, Kaya? I'm pretty good. Woo! There is a lot to talk about. I'm glad you reached out to me and said, look, we got to get on this wire. Let's get it back and let's get it going. These last three weeks are going to be very crucial in these elections. And so I wanted to talk to you uh, exclusively about something that just happened a couple of days ago. And it really is an extension of what we were talking about already. And that was about black men, black male voters, their response or their enthusiasm or lack thereof of Kamala Harris, and also what their thoughts are on Donald Trump. So I'm going to let you set up what happened, and then I'm going to ask the questions. All right. Well, uh, I think that was in Pennsylvania before Barack Obama was set to do um, a campaign event for Kamala Harris. And... Um, he was having a conversation which seemed like more like a um intimate conversation that it was caught on film but he was having a conversation about how he feels like some black men who are supporting trump just don't want a black woman as president and he kind of said you know we kind of got to get out of this misogynistic thing so it kind of felt like finger wagging but then it also felt like, so for me, it's two-sided, right? Because I've been talking to both sides of the coin. And I've talked to guys who support Kamala and I've talked to guys who didn't, you know, who don't support her. And there is some truth to what he was saying, you know, in regard to like, I had a couple of guys that I talked to for like a couple of hours and they claim it was about her policy, but it just didn't logically add up when we start actually talking policy. And after the both times after the two hour conversation at the end, they literally just said, I just don't think a black woman should be president. Mm -hmm. And they both hid behind the same kind of talking points, right? Like they kind of hid behind that, oh, the border, you know, Trump is going to close the border. And, you know, my, my checks were better under Trump and the economy was better, all this and that. And then once I was like, oh, logically that kind of don't bear out. You know what I mean? I'm like, because Trump was the president, the border didn't get fixed. So you can't, you know, really use that. And I gave him the numbers, I'm like the numbers aren't that different between the two administrations. So then they like, oh, well, you know, my check. So then we went to the economy and I showed them the numbers on the economy. And I'm like, these ain't numbers from CNN. These ain't, you know, these are numbers from the Department of Justice. These are numbers from the census. And I'll say, well, Trump's economy had already started going down even before COVID. You know, before COVID, he lost 
hundreds of thousands of jobs and lost manufacturing jobs. I was like, so this is pre-COVID. His economy wasn't good. So after that, then it went to, I just like the way he talks. You know, he say it straight up. He, you know, he, the macho machismo stuff that me and you talk about all the time. And I was like, okay, I get that. But is that a reason to vote? And then I talk about how he wanted qualified immunity for all police officers. I'm like, who do you think that's going to affect? And how his tax break was not good for anybody who wasn't in the Jeff Bezos class. You know, how the tax break that we're still under now. I'm like, we're actually all paying more taxes now than we were before Trump under this tax break. You know, like our taxes are terrible right now. And we got, I think next year his tax break ends. I said, but his tax break has not been really good for the economy. He's still with that old school Republican trickle down. Like we'll give all the breaks to the corporations and they'll in turn give more money to the employees. And we know that's never how it works, you know. Well, uh, but before 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 we get into a lot of the weeds of things, let's kind of I want to break this down with 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 questions so we could take this in small pieces instead okay. of instead of the large the large chunk chunks. I did not hear the whole speech that Obama did. I only heard excerpts. And of course, you know, when you hear excerpts, you don't have a full context of of um, you know, of what happened. And I did hear that, you know, he said, hey, you know, brothers, y'all need to get it together. And uh, I did hear the point where he said, you know, you're just not wanting to vote for Harris because Harris uh, is a woman. And that type of thinking, I think he said, maybe, I don't know if he said antiquated, but that type of thinking is, is you, you need to check that. Something right. like that, right? So my first question is just directly to Dame Crawford. Did you hear the whole speech or did you hear those important sections? And what were your initial, what, what was your initial response? I heard the whole speech and my initial response is honestly, even if some of his message was correct, I don't know if he's the right person to carry that message. Only because there's already people kind of look at him, looking at him sideways, like you ain't do nothing for black men either when you was president. Like nothing specifically for us when you was president. You know, there's not a black agenda we can go back and look at and say Barack Obama did A, B, and C for black men, right? So even if he was correct in that, I don't know if he's the correct messenger just because of that and the feelings that I know a lot of black men have had towards his can his presidency in his eight-year run, right? Um, and you know, there's truth to it, but I think it felt like a bigger generalization than it actually is right um because i know he probably was talking directly to those guys who feel that way but when he said it it felt like the way he said it felt like it was like in a broader sense like there's a lot more black men who are on that page than really are you know right you had you mentioned a a, a stat that still stands that says when you look across all racial ethnic representations of the major ones uh, in the United States and talking about male votership, black males by far kill at the numbers when voting de democratic and even in the last elections. So the question that you had or the criticism that you had, because we talked about this months ago, because black men became like the shit stain of all things bad with the democratic party. Let's, yep. let's keep it funky. Yep. Uh, and so your your pushback was, why are why is there such a target or why is there this conversation or why black men are becoming the problem with black male votership? When you look at all the numbers, they are clearly the the group that votes more with the Dem Democratic Party. So when I heard that, I automatically thought about that conversation. What does that make you feel like when you hear? What, you know, you what, feel what like this, Obama this, said, like, bro, are you really in the barbershops talking to the black men's or right. are you at the Netflix doing your contracts? I don't know. Right, right, right. And and you know what? And that's how I feel. I feel like it's that every four years this kind of happens. The scapegoating starts to lean towards black men. Right. The, the scapegoating starts to lean towards us not voting Democrat when, like you said, like if you look across all demographics, even with the drop off right now, black men are probably still going to be around 78 percent voting for Kamala Harris. And that's down from, I think. 85 percent. 
mm-hmm. before the last election. Right, right, right. And I think what people don't understand is there is a, a lot of people who probably don't want to vote for Kamala because she's a woman. But also, we have to speak to the frustration of Black men and feeling neglected in the outreach, feeling neglected in being heard, feeling neglected in being a part of the actual democratic process when it comes to, you know, the things that are important to us. Because a lot of times, you f- I feel like, my personal opinion, the way the Democrats reach out to us is through things that don't, like, um, it affects us, but not in the way that they think it does. Like, criminal reform isn't the only thing that we care about because we are not all criminals, you know? Um, we uh, clearly a lot of black men care about the border now, you know, uh, clearly a lot of black men, they say black men, the funny thing is black men have been voting for reproductive rights at a higher clip than everybody. This is a real stat. Even women, black men have been voting for reproductive rights. So, you know, that's kind of crazy when you think about it. So the question is that who's reading the numbers, who's giving them the intel and how are they making sense in terms of the public conversation? I also want to say this for me, uh, when I heard what I heard, uh, and I said, I don't, I don't know when shaming and scolding a group is going to be the most effective tactic in order to get them to vote. As a matter of fact, it will probably do the adverse. Ooh, okay. uh, and, so, and, and take that note from the Hillary Clinton Donald Trump election when she called those who voted for Trump uh deplor was it deplorables? Deplorables. Yep. deplorables. Deplorable. And so that voting block said, Well, I'm gonna show you exactly how deplorable I am. I'm actually gonna, you know, double down in, in what I feel and I'm not gonna budge. And those people in large part have remained, remained there. So when yep. you and then another thing I think, and I'm you made a very good point uh that in terms of black the the black male voter disenfranchisement in terms of discourse in terms of having like real conversations and conversations where the average black men is at it's not you know uh uh criminal justice it's around economics a lot of yeah. the conversations that i know are around economics and um and i and and, and as well i i think political discourse whether you agree with it or not, whether your position is on the other side than the person that you're talking to, if you want to have conversation, then have conversation. And I think there is a, the way that I read Obama stuff, it was very condescending and mm-hmm. it was as if talking to black men that they're all ignorant or un. un- educated about the process and live in this Neanderthal type of existence. When there is, there is real data that talks about something like, you know, how black men are the most present fathers when it comes to family structures. Uh, We talked about this last time, how black males in general have been raised in very matriarchal social environments, whether it be the church or whether it be the familial and not because the father is not around it is just an old traditional structure where you either have co-rulership or, you know, big mama or mama has a lot of the last say. Now, now grandpa might say the, the prayer at the dinner table, but grandmama is, is counting that monies in the back. You Absolutely. Know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, so I, 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 and I said, it's really interesting that we are talking about, you're talking to black men about, Harris, but Harris really talks about her fa- her black father who was still living. Her mother is passed, but where the black daddy at? Right. I, I mean, I mean for real. I, I I thought that that was really. I think that's for me. That's odd. And this is the stuff we were talking about earlier when she attempted to run the last election cycle, and you said some of the older women in your family were like it don't smell right. Right. So those right. are some of my initial thoughts. Like, well, where's your black daddy? Yeah. Father. Yeah. And you know what? You make a good point. You make a really good point. And, and, and to your earlier point about like, is he in the barbershops? Because I think if he was in the barbershops, he would understand. 
right? Because I've been having these conversations because I'm like, yo, I just want to understand why Trump, not even why not Kamala. Because I can actually understand that from the standpoint of there's a lot of people who've been like the Democrats haven't done nothing for us and da da da. And, you know, just to be honest, if you're not a political nut like me and you and know how things are actually done and bills are actually passed, you it will look like a lot of the things that they promised, you know, haven't happened. But then when you explain to people like, OK, they were like, well, they were supposed to I'm voting Republican because they were supposed to do the um loan forgiveness i'm like well you know who blocked loan forgiveness it was the republicans you know what i mean like oh we, we the, the black farmers didn't get that money so i'm like well you know who blocked the black farmers it was the people you were about to vote but but like i like i said if you don't know and understand that it just looks like things aren't getting done and they have a messaging problem in in regards to letting people know that right like uh i think me and you when we first got start like when we first started the podcast back talking about this election one of the first things I said is they better hit hard about Trump stopping that bill that Chuck Langford, one of the most conservative, you know, uh, conservative uh, senators wrote for the border. I said they need to hit. And it took them like almost a month and a half to start hitting hard on that. You know what I mean? Like that's, they should have been out the gate. Like we've been working on the border, like da da da, da. because I know that's a big, big, big one that she has like, the least amount of trust on when the polls come out. Like they mm-hmm. trust her the least on the border. And the second was the economy, but her her numbers have went up on the economy, but the border is still a lot lower than Donald Trump. People still, because you know, Trump's rhetoric, of course, is is one factor, but also because I think they just, sometimes they just not gangster enough when it comes to talking about the things that they have done. Um, and then to your point about where's the black daddy and you know, it's just, to me, there's a lack of, how do I say this? <laughs> I think I think sometimes you need a black ear to the streets that's actually from the streets mm-hmm. in order to know where people are really at. And I feel like in her campaign, she doesn't really have that. I feel like she might lean on Charlemagne for that, but he's not actually working in the campaign. Even if, you know what I mean? I think she needs somebody who's working in the campaign who can be like, look, this is what they on right now. This is what they thinking. This is what they saying. Because you said this in this clip, they using this clip like this. You know what I mean? Like, so she would have been able to better combat all the disinformation about her or even the correct information that she's maybe changed her stance on. You know, I don't think she has that person inside of her administration right now. Which calls to question the black card that a lot of people have been capping for her that she has. If you have the quote unquote black card, then how much are you tapped in in terms of what the interests are in the black community as a whole, not just the divine nine or the black women um, or so on and so forth. There's a couple of things I want to respond to, and I didn't uh, finish my thought. And that's in terms of immigration. I think what a lot of people, are, and, 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 and I'm glad you said that, not only are Democrats have been historically bad at messaging, but Democrats really, uh, I think, don't necessarily fall on their own sword or call what what the reality is. Uh, years ago, and I forgot this person, uh, and it was during Tavis Smiley when he used to have kind of like the state of the Black nation conversations. And the woman, I want to say she was out of Chicago, and she said, you know, let's be honest immigration, Black communities are some of the first communities that get impacted economically when you have these immigration bills. This is something that has happened since mass immigration of Europeans came to the U.S., right? The U.S. and and, and just colonizing countries in North America, South America, brought in Europeans in order to create another labor force that would exclude black folk. That was one of the tactics. It's been happening as well as whitening up the society. So mm-hmm. that tactic has been used over and over again, but a lot of the Democratic Party don't want to lose that or or appear to be xenophobic when they talk about how immigration has direct economic impacts on communities that are the most economically vulnerable. And in black communities, black men for a very long time have been the most economically vulnerable in a lot of ways. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so I think when I hear Black men talk about immigration, particularly in places like Los Angeles, which is slightly almost a border city, yeah, where yeah. there's a lot of competition in terms of jobs, some of the undertones or that I hear is, is that a lot of my abilities to work have been replaced when the, the ways of immigration came in and there wasn't anything done in order to address what happens when I'm pushed out of a job. At the same time, you have crack cocaine hits LA and you have this implosion. You have all these black men now you know, being in the drug trade or impacted in some way, shape or form in order to be economically viable or suffer from the residuals of being in the communities as such and don't even have to do with banging or selling drugs. Yep. yep. These are things, these are very real things. These are very real things. I grew up in a community, you know what I'm saying? Like at first you would have brothers come to the door and be like, hey, I'll cut your grass or do your landscaping, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, and then you would have the rollout and then the landscaping industry was taking over. Hey, I cut your, your lawn for $20 less or so $30 less. Yeah, exactly when you're in, yeah, right. And when you're in a community that's economically strapped, you might not want, not want to do it, but you have to make real world decisions. So I want to say that about immigration. Uh, and I don't think, and, and, and what Com Harris is trying to do, because I, I haven't read it, but there's like a, a rollout to directly respond to, to black men's economic decision. I think it was something like do with cannabis, put, you know, do like loan forgiveness or debt forgiveness in terms of that. Now, those promises are going to be very interesting when you had a whole bunch of lawsuits going on, cutting off these initiatives that were black focused in the previous administration. Yeah. But anyway... Okay. So I, I wanted to say that, and then I lost my train of thought with the other stuff, but I know it's going to pop up, but I wanted to really kind of be intentional in, in terms of articulating why I hear and see why black men's concern is the border. It is definitely, eco it's, it's an economic issue. It yes. is an economic issue. And it's not about black men saying that you should not be in the U S and you make a sustainable, livable wage for yourself, but what happens when you are being replaced? And I and this 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 is the second part. And another thing is is that and you talked about why are black men voting for Trump? So I'm gonna go hip hop on this, right? So when Trump first ran in the first election, um, the mainstream media uh, uh, started, of course, because we already knew how Donald Trump was a very popular pop culture figure. Yeah. In, in hip hop. Yeah. You know, in, in specifically generation Xers, you know mm. what I'm saying? And maybe like the younger baby boomers and how hip hop's, uh, sorry, and how Trump's uh, uh, participation in it or being referenced as being this wealth that a generation X under the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. capitalistic uh, type of uh, philosophy, how that was very appealing to the average black man who is attempting to navigate themselves in a, in Reaganomics. All right. And so Trump then not only becomes a popular figure in hip hop, but Trump is a figure that is trending in TV with his, uh, his, his, uh, apprentice, reality apprentice. apprentice show. And, and it's around business and economics, right? So there's a trend. I don't think people are adequately, uh, addressing and because Trump is in this aesthetic, um, and Harris, though, she says she had the Chuck Taylors and all this other stuff is just not right. And so there's a lack of a reference point. And if you're talking about hip hop, the presentation that Trump is coming off more uh, with more, what do you call this uh, organic type of presentation than a Harris is a very palpable argument, uh, in my opinion, when you're looking at it through that lens. And then thirdly, I want to say, I really, it really makes me cringe when we don't acknowledge that black male voters are as complex as the other voters and that you could be conservative on some issues, very conservative on some issues, very liberal on other issues. I don't know why we don't provide that, you know, that, 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 that way. Yeah. yeah. You know, or, 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 yeah, or that grace or that, yeah. When, when you're engaging with them and this idea that 
you should vote. <clears throat> it's enough. It's a remix of what Biden said. You're not black if you don't vote for me. That's basically well, what I also took with the Obama. Yeah, but also what I will say in regards to that, one thing that I think uh, Kamala Harris has been good at speaking on when people ask her about that, even before she dropped her uh, specific agenda for black men, she said, y'all framing the question wrong. When she's when they asked her, they said, um, you know, how do you feel about black men that starting to vote for Trump and da 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 da? She said, well, y'all framing the question wrong because y'all framing the question as if they have to vote for me. Y'all framing the question as if it's taken for granted that they are going to vote for me. And she said, that's not the way it works. And she said, I have to earn their vote just like I have to earn everybody else's vote. And mm. she said, in order to earn their vote, that means I have to speak specifically to their issues. I will say she's been saying that. Like, if you go back to the interview she did with the NA, NABJ, mm -hmm. they asked her that. And every time they ask her that question, as if, like, you're supposed to be mad that Black men are vote for Trump, she tells them, she's like, y'all talking like they're a monolith, and y'all talking like Black men are just supposed to vote for me, and that's not so. So I will say she's been consistent with that on, you know, talking about this on, on the trail so far. And um, I think yesterday... Um, I don't know if you saw last night, she did a, a, an audio town hall with Charlemagne. And it was about an hour, about an hour and a half with questions from a live audience and people on the radio. And she had, uh, you know, the brother who has started New Era in Detroit. He was there. Uh, I think these were probably some of the toughest questions she's got in regard to Black folks specifically. Mm -hmm. And I thought she did a good job navigating it. I thought she did a good job answering most of the questions. There were a couple of she, you know, she kind of skirted by, but for the most part, I think she hit most of the questions head on. And I think Charlemagne did something really smart with the interview. When he first started the interview, he said, people say that you're too scripted and that it's hard to really get to know you and talk to you because everything is so scripted. And I think that made her have to do the interview differently mm -hmm. because of that initial first question right but she did say she said well that's called discipline and she said when you run in a race you have to be disciplined she said because i have to repeat she said people are just getting to know me and i'm only 70 days into this race and people are getting to know me she said so i do have to re repeat my points constantly everywhere i go to make sure she said and that's how you actually run a campaign and she said so yes, there are points that I have to make sure that I make, she said, because I got to make sure that everybody hears these points. And she's like, that's what you call running a discipline race. I'm like, okay, I thought that was a good answer. But then again, after that, like I said, I feel like that disarmed her a little bit. And I feel like you got more real questions. Like, of course, she slipped some of her talking points. You know, I grew up in the middle class. You know, she, she mm -hmm. slipped those in. But for the most part, I think she was hitting the questions head on. And she didn't give that um, I'm offended by a tough question that I felt like Biden would do a lot. Or Hillary Clinton did. Right. When. Yeah. Yeah. So that I, mean, I did not. I, I did not. I was actually traveling uh, yesterday and I, I have a whole bunch of news that I have to get through. But that's good to know. My question to you is, is that so if Harris is saying one thing, but the Democratic machine is pushing this other narrative, what where's the disconnect? Um, well, I think some of the disconnect was like literally between her and Barack personally. <clears throat> Got you. I think some of the disconnect was like, I feel like she, without saying it, I feel like she kind of like, I didn't tell him to say that shit. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what it yeah. feels like. Like She's trying to be very diplomatic about it, but I, I could tell she's really like, I did not ask him to say that. And I agree with her there because, like I said, it's not in line with what she's been saying. Mm -hmm. It's not in line with what she's been saying about uh, black male voters in regards to having to earn their vote and having to go out there and meet them where they are and to talk to them and have specific conversations. And then she did. She referenced. She said, look, I know people want to say this is something I'm only doing because I'm running. She said, but I actually have a record. You can go back and look at when I bought uh, the, the Black Men's Business Association to come talk to me at the White House to talk about the issues they were having. She's like, you can go back to when I made sure that billions of dollars went into the community bank so we could have more capital going to uh, Black neighborhoods. She said, you can go back to when I met with the, the big tech guys and the, the um, 
what do they call it? the uh, VCs, the venture capitalists. She said, because only 1% of venture capitalist money goes to black men. She said, 1%. She said, so I've been having me. So she said, this is not new for me. She said, but I just wanted to lay this out on the platform. But of course, because it feels like people saying that she's not doing anything. She's like, but I've been doing this. Because that's what one of the questions was. It feels like the timing of this is just that you need some votes and da da da. And she's like, no, I just want to highlight what I have been doing. She's like, I need to message Chia what I've been in. She laid out all the stuff that she's been working on, all the stuff she's been doing all the way back to her uh, as an attorney general. And I think she did a good job with that. And again, because this goes back to what me and you spoke about in regards to her messaging and people just not knowing the things she did. Like a lot of people still don't even know about uh, the uh, the first step program that she did where she was, you know, trying to keep black men out of jail for marijuana and lower level um okay. like non like nonviolent mm -hmm. offenses. And mm -hmm. so the the narrative is still she locked up a bunch of black men for weed more than the actual truth of, you know, she started the first step act to try to make sure they didn't have a record and try to make sure they could get a job. But to me, again, that goes to messaging because everybody should know that by now. Everybody should know about that. And, and we still shouldn't be battling people saying that she locked thousands of black people up for weed and the funny thing is what i've seen is there's been a lot of white men saying that not even black people like black people have been saying it but like if i'm on twitter like, oh y'all gonna vote for her she didn't block the first of all like you care about black men and second mm -hmm. of all like it's a lie you know what i mean but i've seen a lot of white men parroting that because i think that's what trump's uh administration has been pushing out to his surrogates wow um you gave a lot i'm glad you earmarked that forgot to mention that Harris just jumped into the campaign. And one of the things that she had to do was she had to present a campaign that was organically or hers in her name while still operating as a vice president and as well separating herself from the Biden campaign or agenda. So there's a lot of different things going on at the same time that she had to multitask and maneuver. So 100% give full credit to that because that's a, that, that is a, that is a lot. Uh, even, you know, as we know, there are quite a few people who are, you know, helping sort that out. So that 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 undoing uh, is very important. I think also another thing that you pointed out so aptly uh, from this is how I read it when you said she didn't ask Obama to to say that, but Obama did that. I think that also speaks to the issues with women in politics, right? 100%. And so, you know what I'm saying? And so the, and, and, and me, I, I, I'm a political head. I, I, I've been working in and out of the political scene since I was a teenager in LA. And it always behooved me the way that women are treated and often slighted uh, when it comes to public discourse about the state. And it's like this under thing of either let me talk for you because they don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> And at yeah. the end, when you say you didn't need to say that, I could have said that uh, the response from the man is, is that, oh, I was just trying to do you a solid, you know, yep. you know what I mean? And, and, and that's exactly what it felt like. It kind of felt like I could say this and you can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, let me say this for you because you can't say it. And I'm, I, I, she was like, I don't need you to say that for me. That's not the message I'm pushing. You know what I mean? And like right. you said, somebody came back like, well, I was just trying to hook you up, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And then another thing uh, that I do acknowledge because you and I know, because we've been knowing each other for a very long time. And when you were starting your career, your musical career, I was an entertainment journalist. And we often talked about our experiences from both sides of the inter entertainment industry, which politics falls into a lot of that is, is that America is a misogynistic culture. I, I let's start with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, straight up. Like I was like, saying, let's keep, let's keep let's say, America is a patriarchal, misogynistic, hyperviolent culture. Yeah. And it doesn't start with black men, right? No. Uh, no, you know what I mean? And, and, and this is a fact. Black men have been the recipients of this violent culture as much as all the other folk that don't represent who's the person or persons in power, right? It is just, in my opinion, it, in terms of how people talk about proximity to whiteness, uh, but there's also this proximity to this, this power structure. And I think that is the follies of what has happened in all communities. But when we're talking specifically about, because there's machismo, that's mm -hmm. real gutter, 
in the Latino yep. community that I don't think we address when we have these political discussions. Uh, but let's talk, you know, but the the black male masculinity somehow becomes the most toxic. I right. was like, I don't know. And I, it's not I, even close. Right, exactly. You it's know, even, yeah. you know, uh, but I do acknowledge that because of the proliferation of media, it presents itself that black men or black males display this level of masculinity or uh, um, uh, a toxic masculinity in ways on the everyday that I, I don't engage uh, or that I don't experience, even though I do ex experience it. So, um, but at the same time, misogyny is a serious problem. Uh, and there have been a lot of black female uh, candidates in offices across the board who have suffered as a result of these misogynistic notions. But it's not just from black men. <laughs> it's from no, all men. It's from all men. It's from all men. But you know, like like I'll say, I'll say this like and women. Let's say this because you could be a woman and be misogynistic. And, and Sometimes the women are worse. Okay. Listen, I've seen, I've seen a lot of that, right? On both sides. I've seen them like the way they have been getting that Kamala Harris is the way I haven't seen them get at any candidate ever. Right. When you see them posting videos of, I mean, pictures of her, like AI made pictures of her with her boobs out and stuff, talking about slept her way to the top. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's, that's a different kind of discourse, right? Like that's not policy. That's degrading her as a black woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the, the standard that they hold her to for having slept with Willie Brown 30 years ago, who was separated and they were actually in a relationship opposed to Donald Trump, who has had five wives and affairs with every wife, affairs on every wife, and paid a porn star. The standard that they hold them to is like, well, she can't be president because she did that 30 years ago, but Donald Trump can be president with all the things he did. That speaks to the inbred misogyny that we do have mm -hmm. uh, in this country. And like you said, it's not just coming from black men, it's coming from men, it's coming from women of all races, all shapes and sizes, you know, all people who just are misogynistic. And like I said, I've seen so many men and women just say, I just don't think a woman should be president. Mm -hmm. And then so specifically, I just don't think a black woman should be president. Somebody said this to me. I don't want Kamala Harris to be the president because black women already think they are that. <laughs> you ain't gonna be able to tell them shit if a black woman is president. Wow. Okay. So that bears the other question that I have. I have a couple. What is it about you think in your, yeah, your experiences and from these conversations, what is it about a black woman in le full leadership that is like the center of the uncomfortability? Well, I think for some of the black men, it is the, like, you know, what I just said, they feel like black women don't think they are that, which I don't see nothing wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But I, also, but I also think they feel like they're getting skipped in a way. Like, yeah, we have Barack Obama, but we should have a couple more black men before we get to a black woman because mm -hmm. it's been white men. So they feel like, you know how me and you talked about this years ago, how some black men don't want to dismantle uh the oppression they want to be able to participate correct fully and i think that's what a lot of it is right like when they talk about how trump speaks i'm like you will never be able to speak like trump and get away with that shit you will never be able to you know even if you was a rich black man as diddy is showing y'all right now even if you're a rich black man you don't get to grab him by the and be okay you know what i mean for for life I should, right <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So so it's, it's, it's a lot of that. I think a lot of them wanting to participate in being the oppressor as opposed to dismantling the oppression. And I think that's where the disconnect is between a lot of, I'll say, politically astute black men and politically astute black women. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference between a lot of them. A lot of the black men don't want the oppression dismantled. They're like, no, we want to be able to do it, too where a lot of the politically stupid black women are like, no, this system is terrible. It doesn't work like this. And we need to dismantle it in order for it to be equitable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a bigger conversation that is not being had in regards to why there's such a disconnect between black men and black women a lot of times on these topics. And again, we're talking about those specifically who are voting for Trump. 
You know what I mean? Like we're talking about those. Like I'm not talking about all black men. I'm talking about all black women. I just want to be clear before this clip gets cut up into something that is not, right? But I'm talking about those who are specifically voting for Trump out of misogyny, right? Because that's like, you know, that's a very specific place. Because like I said, I know there there are those who are, who have given me like their policy reasons for why they want to vote for Trump or why they trust Trump over Kamala. But a lot of the people, a lot of these people, I'm like, how do I know your candidate's policy better than you do? Mm -hmm. So that means it's not really about policy for you. If I'm trying to talk policy and I'm like, what about Trump's policy? And you can't even explain to me about Trump's policy. So it's those type of things that, you know, she's combating as well. But you know what, Dame, I want to say this. What you're talking about is the average American voter that doesn't know how to articulate or know all of the intricacies of any policy that any of the uh, national or local candidates are standing for. So let's let's and, and that is a very intentional thing. There's this really great book. I forgot the name of the book, but it talks of it, it's it's this idea of the masses and when the U.S. is structuring itself and uh, knows that eventually you're going to have to start allowing. <laughs> the the immigrants, the European immigrants and, and, and the black folk that are coming out of slavery and those who are already free, this this thing called citizenship or to practice in a, a democracy where they can vote. Right. So it was to create a set of roadblocks and obstacles so that voter participation is at minimal. And because the thing is, is that when it is at a minimal, then the status quo will remain the status quo. But if you have a lot of people involved in it, then the st the power will recalibrate itself just naturally. All, just the fact that, you know, if you cast it, if it, it, just casting a ballot and just being present. So let alone actually having conversation and knowing what's going on, right? And so I don't yeah. think people understand that this is a very intentional thing that has gone on and most voters are uninformed. I don't know why we just drop it on black people or black men. I no. think also this is very bad. I think this this timing is very interesting, not bad. I think it's very interesting that you do have the ditty because you did mention the diddly. I'm sorry, the, 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 I said the diddly. Uh, you did the Dittler. Yes, you did mention the Dittler. And I think that this timing is really kind of interested because even in my in, in the spaces that I'm in, I've had white women specifically talk, have wanting to have a, a, a conversation with me about domestic violence and black men's violence against black women. And I'm like, well, white men far more exceed in numbers. Uh, when you talk about domestic violence, so maybe you need to go back and talk to your white men's is, you know, in it, but there's or this. Or more specifically, police officers. Oops. The highest amount of domestic violence is by Oops. police officers. Male Oops. Police officers. Well, uh, and, and there you go. So, so there, but, but, but see, but this is how media presents and projects these ideas that are not even statistically factual. Right. And, and that's why you have to be careful with these conversations, like I said, with Barack Obama, even though there was some truth to what he was saying about the misogyny, you had a private conversation in front of company. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like an old black man from Mississippi when you said that. <laughs> you can't have that conversation in front of company. Yes, yes. Yeah, you can't have that conversation in front of company because what happens is they take that and say, look, even Barack Obama is saying, but you know, the bastion of black men mm -hmm. to America. Even Barack Obama is saying that black men mm -hmm. ain't vote for Kamala. But but, that's that, but, but 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 that's a, a, that is a sophisticated tactic as well. I'm not saying Obama is the carrier out of it, but this idea of taking a nugget of truth and but wrapping it around a whole bunch of BS and lies or confusion and chaos, uh, you know, is what I see is what's happening. And we talked about this after this election. I still got to, you know, communicate and commune with my community, whatever yeah. they're voting uh, whatever they are Preference on the voting, yeah. right? Preferences are. And the thing is, is that it seems like, you know, black communities are only communities that have to have like this fallout as a result of people's voting preferences, you know? Uh, so I think that that's also something that gets lost in the conversation. But I want to know uh, as we wrap up, and I do thank you, what do you think? Well, let me say this as well. I think this is actually a really great time for black male voters to begin to, and I, I'm already seeing it. They're talking about their ideas, what they don't like, what they like. Um, 
And I, and I really do appreciate that. I could, uh, let, let me, oh, there's so many things I was thinking about. Black men, let's keep it a buck, were the physical representation of Black Lives Matter movement for many, many, many years. Not symbolically, but the dead bodies of Black men and heterosexual right. Black men at that, right. Right? right? Not all, but mo majority of them. But at the end of the Black Lives Matter movement, heterosexual Black men became the bane of Black progress. Absolutely. Right? So now we're at this position where you have this, because every major election is the election of the lifetime. And now Black men are being singled out. I really believe that there's this idea that Black male political participation is the kind of like the weakest. And it's kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Dinging somebody when they're down. Okay. Right. So, uh, and this is me, I'm a, you know, I am a heavy critic of black men. All right. A, a, right. a very heavy critic, but what are the larger implications of this discussion in terms of black male votership and political participation for you? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because I've thought about this and the, um, the microscope that has been put on black men, it shows me that we tend to have a lot more sway and a lot more power as a voting block. And we should recognize that and do a better job of utilizing that and, you know, utilizing that leverage to get the things that we need for our communities. Um, I think this speaks to the fact that maybe our vote does matter because, you know, for a while they tried to make it seem like black men's vote specifically didn't matter if they had the black women's vote. But now looking at this race, you like, no, the black man's vote, especially for a black candidate, because we have to add that context as well. Right. Especially for a black candidate, you need every black vote you can get because you're not going to get a lot of the white male vote. And regardless of what they say about reproductive rights, you're not going to get a lot of the white female votes because they still going to vote with their men. They still going to vote in their best interest for their pockets. You know what I mean? Um, I know she's like you said, she had to do a tightrope with this campaign of coming out and showing that she could be president for everybody, showing that she's diplomatic, showing that she could be good on the border, showing that she could be good in matters of world affairs. Then she had to show that she had a personality. Then she had to show that she could be hardline without being too hardline because you don't want to be the angry black woman. And then now we're getting to the wire like and so now I got to go speak specifically to black people after I did all these other things you know because I had to speak to women about reproductive rights because that's the biggest block like I think the campaign has done mostly a, a, a bang up job of like figuring out where to have her like I know she's supposed to go do Fox News today she's doing Fox News today um which I think is smart um she's been doing different podcasts she did all the smoke with uh matt barnes and uh stephen jackson so she's been going to places where you can find black men she did uh call her daddy which is like the biggest second biggest podcast in the world behind joe rogan and i heard she's thinking about actually going to do joe rogan and i think as she gets more comfortable you're going to see her in more places like she did the colbert show drunk a beer you know and it was like a lot more relaxed so i think you they're, they're starting to try to show her in the more i guess this is the light you show her in for the people like you said are the low propensity voters the people mm -hmm. who don't know much so now it's like the people who you say are the average american voters they're starting to put her in those places where it's just like we just need y'all to like her because if y'all like her y'all vote for her because like you said if you're not like a political nut like that, you're not going to jump into the weeds of policy, really. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so I think they're starting to get her in those places. And, you know, Charlemagne did say something in that um, that town hall yesterday that I thought was interesting. He said, you know, Barack Obama is wagging his finger at black men. Like, when Hillary Clinton going to come wag her finger at white women? <laughs> oh. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Chuck Schumer gonna come wag his finger at white men. White men, right? Do, like, what, and, 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 at white men. That's a very good point because this is what I was saying yesterday <laughs> when I was speaking, you know, about this, and I said why I don't understand this tactic, and it's it 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 seems like it is always targeted to black voters where you have this representative that nobody, you know, uh, 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 pick selected, come <laughs> and tell us. Or, right. You know, what's right and what's wrong. I don't see that in any community publicly. Now, of course, you have private conversations, but the way in which it does, it, it is done 
it, it, and, and, and then on top of that, and let's keep it all the way funky. Cause, uh, we would like for you to come to Ark Republic and have a conversation, uh, you know, Miss Harris, but if you don't, we all, it's all great because we still going to talk about you. Thank you for tuning into Ark Republic's news podcast. We are a small media organization with big news energy and cover topics from a global lens and work to uncover rich and robust stories. Any contribution towards our operation will fuel a much needed media revolution. Okay, so um, last thoughts. I, we, I have so many questions, but I, I know I don't want to keep you. Um, oh, question. What has this done in your, from your perspective? What has this done for the elections? Has it moved something? Do you think it's going to have some significant changes? If so, what do you think that's going to look like? Yeah, I think it has. I think it's going to have some larger implications uh, moving forward either way. Uh, no matter who wins, because I think you're going to have people who are going to be engaged more moving forward because mm. you start, you know, as the races go, if you go back to 2016, you see a little more engagement in 2020, right? Now mm -hmm. you see a lot more engagement in 24 as, than you did in 2020. Mm -hmm. So I think um, this is going to get more Black folks in particular to pay attention. And not just pay attention to the presidential race now. I think because like last year was probably one of the first times I had black folks hit me up to ask me about specifically talking about midterms. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of times black folks don't even care about the midterms, don't go and vote for them. Or a school board election or any of that. School board election, yeah, and all that. But I had people asking me about midterms and uh, propositions and all of that, you know, in my inbox saying certain things. So I think we're going to get more politically engaged from this and you know i hope uh we'll get more of us that are educated on the process from this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well um we have three weeks to go uh it's probably going to feel like three years by the time we're on the other side of it this was a right. very kind of sober conversation um i don't know what that is saying going forward but i do appreciate your insight thank you for pulling me in so we can have this conversation giving me those corrections uh and that insight about uh harris and i too have to check myself too as you know as well as making sure that i stay calibrated on on, on both sides in terms of understanding but for those of you who are listening remember to vote local watch your local candidates and i do have to give credit to the Harris Walls campaign for putting money in, um, you know, the voting down ballot, ballot. No, yeah, down ballots, a lot yeah, of money in down, money ballot. In down, down ballot, down, yeah, yeah, down ballots, which is really, really important because if you have a strong local representation, the national representation won't hit hard as much. Exactly. exactly. All right. Thank you, Dane. All right. Thanks for having me.